Hello, welcome back to the 8-Bit Guy. So in a previous episode, I covered this little guy here, which is a clone of the Kovac speech thing. And uh, I was pretty excited about this because it would finally allow me to be able to use my 46 laptop, which is my favorite DOS gaming laptop, and actually get some kind of sound other than the PC speaker sound. Now, um, that's, you know, it doesn't work with all games, but it works with quite a few, whether I'm using the Kovacs or the Tandy emulator. But um, shortly after I did the episode on this, the same guy that created this uh, sent me an email and asked me, says, hey, David, what would you think if I could put an ad lib on a similar type parallel card? And I said, well, you know, that's pretty cool. I actually have no doubt you could put the Yamaha YM3812 chip on a card like this. But I had serious doubts whether or not you would actually be able to get it to work with existing DOS games. Well, I recently received this in the mail. Now, he claims he's done it. And uh, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to assemble this card. And I'm going to hook it up to my favorite 46 here. And we're going to find out, does it work? Let's get started. All right. Uh, so let's see what's in the kit. There's quite a few little parts, but it doesn't look too daunting. Here's the actual circuit board, and this, of course, is the main component, the Yamaha YM3812. It's hard to believe you can still buy these chips brand new. I'm not sure what they're used for these days, but this is identical to the one made back in the 1980s. You could put this chip in an original Adlib card or one of these old Yamaha keyboards, and it would work just fine. I'm going to go ahead and assemble this. If you don't want to watch the assembly, uh, just skip forward to about 8 minutes 30 seconds. He sent me these documents. He said he was working on some better assembly instructions for future customers, but I actually received one of the first prototypes, uh, so this is what I get to work with. However, it isn't that hard to figure out. Uh, these are capacitors because they start with a C. Uh, J usually means some kind of jumper, and R is for resistor, and so on. So the way we do this is we look at the diagram and we pick a part. Uh, this one, for example, shows to be C3. And we can see over here on the bill of materials that uh, C3 is uh, this part here. I'm going to start with this socket. I like to start with the shortest components first for various reasons. Now, what you need to make sure on these sockets is that you find the little notch and that you line it up with the notch that's etched onto the board. Another thing I do is solder two opposite pins of the socket in place first. That way I can turn it around and double check that it's completely flush with the board and also double check the notch is lined up one more time before soldering the rest of the pins. I guess I can take this opportunity to mention something. Every time I do a soldering episode, I get a few criticisms from people on my soldering technique. Everything from the temperature of my soldering iron, uh, to the fact that I let the solder touch the tip of the iron, and uh, even people complain about the way us Texans actually pronounce the word solder because we leave the L silent. So I could just say right now that I've never claimed to be an expert at this. Uh, I never had anyone teach me to solder. I had to learn how to do all this when I was about 12 years old. <laughs> and so much like my uh, programming techniques and my musical skills, they're all self-taught. I do what works best for me. I make no claims in my videos that it's the right version or the best way to do stuff. So <laughs> that's my disclaimer. Apparently my camera wasn't running when I soldered this USB power port, but it was probably the toughest piece on the board because the little pins are so small. Moving along, I'm going to do this crystal next. Uh, there is no specific orientation for this. It fits there, nice and flush. Um, I'll bend the pins out a little bit to hold it in place while I solder. And there we have it. All that's left to do is cut the excess leads off uh, with some wire cutters. The next part I will install is this little 14 pin IC. There's no socket for this one, but you still need to be sure to line up the notch on the chip so you know it's in the correct direction. One of the problem you might notice is that the legs are just a bit too wide to get to fit down in the board. So one trick I usually do is press the chip up against the workbench surface until they bend inwards just slightly. I do this on both sides. Now it will be much easier to fit in there. There we go. Just need to solder all of those legs. So if you're wondering why I do the shorter components first, the main reason has to do with making it easier to solder. Because when I turn the board upside down, I want the part to stay in place. But if there were taller objects on there already, then the parts would fall out unless you held them in place somehow. Next up is the reset switch. It apparently needs this because the synthesizer chip is powered externally. So if you turn off the computer in the middle of a game, uh, the notes will just hang rather than shut off. So you can just press this button to reset the chip. Now, you might be thinking the orientation of this button would be confusing because the pins look like a square arrangement. 
However, they're just slightly rectangular, so there's no way to put this in the wrong direction. However, it does require some force to snap it down in there. Next, I'm going to do these little resistor packs. These do have a specific direction they go in, so you have to pay attention to this little dot that represents pin 1. And then on the board, um, pin 1 is the one that has the little square etched around it. So the first one goes in here, and the other resistor pack goes over here. And next up, I'll be putting in the headphone or line output jack. My understanding is it's amplified enough to work for either one, and it goes right here on the board. OK, I'll solder that in now. All right, I'm going to do the resistors next. Now, fortunately, he has labeled these with their values, which is really nice for me since I have problems reading the color codes on these. So fortunately, I don't have to get the meter out to read these. Uh, however, these do mount in a very unusual way. Um, they're meant to be vertically mounted. Let me pull these end pieces off here, and I'll show you what I mean by that. OK, so you need to bend these things all the way around 180 degrees, like this. Then you need to slide it down into the holes, like so. Uh, this is done to help make the board more compact. Uh, it solders in just like any other resistor, though. And uh, that's what a vertical resistor looks like. And uh, that's pretty much how all of the resistors are going to be mounted on this board. In fact, here you can see where I finished mounting all of the resistors. Next up are these disk capacitors. The print is too small for my eyes, so I have to use a magnifying glass to see which values they are. Uh, these just slide in like so. They are not polarity sensitive, so they can go in either direction. There is one jumper on the board. I think this is for a base boost option or something. Anyway, it uh, mounts right here like so. There are quite a few electrolytic capacitors, and these do have a very specific polarity. Uh, you see the little white stripe here? That indicates the negative side, and uh, that needs to line up with the thicker part of the circle. Also, you might notice that the shorter lead is also the negative. And when you're done with all of the capacitors, it should look like this. Next, I'll put in this LED. Now, you might be asking how you can tell which direction it goes. Well, uh, one of the leads is longer than the other. Uh, that is the positive lead, and the shorter is the negative, uh, much like the capacitors that we just did. OK, so this is the last big component that I need to solder. Um, it's just a matter of lining it up and popping it down in there. I should mention that these larger end pieces don't actually conduct any signal, uh, but they are used to carry the physical stress of the connector, specifically when pushing in or pulling out the uh, parallel cable. So you need a big old blob of solder on these for structural purposes. And there you have it. Next, I'm going to insert these two chips, uh, starting with the small one, uh, paying close attention to the orientation. And of course, here comes the YM3812, the main attraction in this build. And there you go. Uh, you might think we're done, but there's actually one more part. And uh, this is the only part I'm not fond of. And the reason I'm not fond of it is due to how it goes on here. Um, you can see right here, that's where it goes. Uh, but what you have to do is bend these pins out 90 degrees, like so. And uh, then it goes in like this. And yeah, it just hangs off the side like that. OK, time to test this thing out. I'll use my favorite 46 laptop, whose only downside is a lack of a sound card. For power, I'll use a standard USB cable and an iPhone charger. Rather than plugging in speakers, I'm going to connect it to this USB audio recorder so that we can get a clear recording of what comes out of this thing. Alright, let's see what happens. A test program is included that makes it really simple to tell if the board is working or not. It's called OPL2 Test. Woohoo! So it looks like my board is working. Before we go any further, I need to explain a few things about the design, and let's start with some terminology. This product is called the OPL2 LPT, and I should probably explain why. The OPL2 refers to the type of sound chip, and the LPT is an old MS-DOS term, and it refers to local print terminal, or basically a parallel port. Now, let's demystify the terminology on the sound chip. The Yamaha YM3812 is an FM synthesizer chip, but it was also nicknamed the OPL2, which stands for FM Operator Type L, version 2. It was used in famous sound cards, starting with the AdLib, and eventually in other cards like the Sound Blaster and Pro Audio Spectrum. Later on, Yamaha came out with the YMF262, which is a backwards compatible chip, but offering more voices and waveforms than the earlier design. 
This was nicknamed the OPL3, and it was used in cards like the Sound Blaster 16, Pro Audio Spectrum 16, and clones such as the ESS Audio Drive or Crystal Audio. And even though both chips are technically ad-lib compatible, uh, the vast majority of DOS games only made use of the original OPL2 chip. And uh, this is the chip that is featured in the product I'm about to demonstrate. First of all, there are literally zero MS-DOS games that will work with this thing natively. The AdLib card was always expected to be found on the computer's main bus at port 388, but the parallel port is expected to be found at port 378, so how do we correct for this? Well, there are a few different ways to make this work. At the moment, the most practical way is by using the driver that is included. You'll need to start it up before you play your game, and what it will do is intercept all of the attempted writes to port 388 and redirect them to port 378 instead. So uh, that's what I'm going to try first. The first thing I'll need to do is start up the driver. Uh, you can add this to your auto exec if you don't want to type it in every time. OK, that started. Now I'm going to load one of my favorite DOS games that has really good music. Alright, uh, this is freaking amazing. Um, I've never heard music like this come out of my 46 laptop. And uh, this sounds absolutely perfect. Uh, this is not an emulation, rather it's the real thing. You know, I might sound a bit like a heretic when I say this, but I actually prefer the ad-lib music on Lemmings over the Amiga version. I've spent plenty of my life playing both versions, and both are absolutely great, but I think the ad-lib with its extra voices really makes this musical score shine. Uh, with the Amiga having only four voices, uh, one of them being needed for sound effects, uh, left this music being essentially three voices, and uh, the ad-lib really pulls this off well. Although admittedly, uh, the sound effects on the Amiga were much better, and I really loved the sound of the lemmings when they fell to their death on the Amiga version. Uh, here on the ad-lib version, they just make a little splatting sound. Okay, so on to another game. Adamino is one of those games that I absolutely love and I've spent a lot of time playing the Amiga, DOS, and Commodore 64 versions, yet when I ask other people about the game, most people have never heard of it. Uh, but one thing all three versions have in common is they have excellent musical scores that are really well tailored to the hardware. Anyway, uh, let's try one more people will be familiar with. Oh man, I love the music in this game. And this is another where I think the ad-lib version actually sounds really nice, possibly better than all of the other sound cards. I'll have to duck the tomatoes when I say I actually prefer it over the MT32 version. Now one thing I should mention is that Ultima 6 only plays music through the ad-lib. The sound effects always come from the PC speaker, which I've dubbed in here. Let's try another game. Uh, this one is not heavy on music, but does use the ad-lib for sound effects. And it seems to sound fine as well. Uh, let me try uh, shooting something so we can hear some more sound. Okay, uh, let's move along to something with more music in it. Sierra was one of the first companies to really help push the ad-lib card into popularity by vowing to support it on all of their games, and they did a pretty good job of utilizing it too. Ok, 
Okay, so far, just about every 1980s game I have thrown at this thing works fine. So here's a thought. It's not very well known, but the AdLib card is actually capable of doing digital samples. It just wasn't used very much because um, it doesn't have any sort of DMA, so the CPU has to do all of the work, much like doing samples on the PC speaker. So I thought maybe we should try a few games that actually do use digital samples on the AdLib. Uh, I'll start with this one. Gentlemen, start your engine. And to my surprise, it works perfectly. Uh, this game has no music in it, to my knowledge, uh, only sound effects. Let's try another game that uses both digital music and sound effects. Pinball Fantasies. And it also seems to be working perfectly. Sounds a heck of a lot better than the PC speaker version. Alright, so uh, this little guy, along with the driver, worked with practically every game uh, from the 1980s that I tried to throw at it. Um, there were a few problems, though. <laughs> There were a few games, such as Tetris Classic, that behaved strangely. Uh, technically, the sound worked, but for some reason it plays slowly. I mean, the tempo is just dragging here for some reason. The music should be playing about 50% faster than this. However, all the sound effects are timed perfectly, so I have no idea what's causing this. So now let me give you the really bad news. So the driver does require a 3D6 processor. So you can't use it with a 286 or an XT of any sort. And this is due to some special features of the 3D6 processor, which allows it to essentially do some virtualization where it can intercept all of the calls being made to port 388 and redirect them. Also, as a result of this, any games that require 386 enhanced mode to operate will not work with this driver. So many of the games that were made during the 1990s that require a more high-end DOS machine flat out aren't gonna work with this thing. However, not all hope is lost. There are still some possible ways to make it work. And that's by patching the game. If you were to find the parts of the machine code that actually write to port 388 and actually change it to 378 instead, the game would not need a driver and would just natively write to port 378 on its own. And uh, let me demonstrate this with the game Heretic. So you just run this AD patch program. So it looks like I need to add a dash I in the name of the executable. So let's try that. Okay, says it's patching the game. Well, let's see if it works. Keep in mind, this game would not work with a driver and there's no driver currently loaded. And it does appear to be working. Uh, now, unfortunately, this game does not support sound effects on the ad lib. It requires a sound blaster for that, but uh, you can at least get the music, which is more than I was able to get before. The patch program is in an experimental stage right now, and they're still working on improving it, so I imagine as time goes on, it will probably support more and more games. In fact, uh, Heretic wasn't even on the list of games that they had confirmed that it works with, but it still worked. I suspect they just hadn't tried that game yet. Of course, there is another way to get this thing to work with more games, and that would be to encourage developers who are still making DOS games today to actually add native support for the device right into the code on purpose. One example is a CGA game that's in development right now that supports it. It's called Castle Viana, and uh, it's in an early stage of development, but uh, the author has pledged to support the, this device. And uh, myself, I'm planning on uh, doing a port of my Planet X2 to MS-DOS. I'm actually already working on that right now, and uh, I plan to support this device natively in my code as well. One other thing I wanted to mention about this board is that uh, you can actually run it off of any 5 volt power source you want. In fact, he's even put these two little special solder pads right here on the board so you could solder it up to you know any kind of power source you have in mind. Uh, you could even theoretically use the PS2 port on your laptop computer, for example, um, if you uh, didn't want to use an external power supply. All right, so you may be wondering where you can get one of these magical devices. Uh, well, if you happen to live in Europe, then you probably should buy from certashop.com, and I'll put a link down in the description field for you. Uh, if you live in North America, 
Then, good news, I have them available in my web store. Um, I bought 40 of these from Sergi, and uh, they are uh, for sale right now, both in kit form, and I've been soldering together some pre-assembled units for those uh, people who don't feel like uh, soldering their own kits together. Uh, so you can buy it either as a kit or fully assembled. Anyway, uh, I, I don't know if 40 will be enough. I might sell out tonight, but if, if I do, don't worry, I'll, I'll get more. This is a product I'm gonna be carrying uh, from now on in my web store, at least until the new version comes out. Speaking of the new version, so Surge has been working on a newer version of this that uses the OPL3 chip. And while not many games actually benefit from this version of the chip, the main advantage is that it's surface mount, and uh, these can be assembled by machine, which would reduce the cost and time of manufacture. All of the OPL2 versions were either assembled by hand or sold as kits, like the one I got. Um, no word yet on when that one will be available other than probably the first half of 2018. So if you really want one of these right now, you yeah, might as well just order the OPL2 version. Well, um, I guess that about wraps it up for this episode, so uh, thanks for watching and stick around to the next one and I'll see you then.